Well done. Sort that curtain out. There we go. All right. Well, first of all, uh, introductions. I shouldn't stand in front of everyone there. Um, my name is Mark. Uh, I'm from the Oz DeFi Association. Oh, did it? Hello. There we go. I'm from the Oz DeFi Association. Um, we're not that old, very young, and yet we've been amazed by how much this space has grown since the start of this year. And we are here to do an Oz DeFi and Sensand meetup. And we'll talk more about that and introduce the panelists, the fine panelists that are here. But before we get started, we do need to, as we do in Sydney and in Brisbane when we run these events, uh, welcome to country and acknowledge where we stand. So, um, so please uh, join me in, um, where is the wording? Because I've forgotten that I apologize. I begin today by acknowledging the name of the uh, Kulin uh, people, traditional custodians on the land on which we gather today, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and future. So thank you very much. On the panel today, we've got three uh, special guests, and we'll go through them very uh, soon. I'll get them to do their own intros. Um, but when we do these in Sydney, we usually run quite a few different things. We've tested out so many different styles from just doing a networking thing to doing a panel to doing uh, interviews with people and the projects that they've got. So if you guys are doing interesting things here in Melbourne, NFTs, DeFi, Metaverse, anything, get in touch with us because we want to hear from you guys and everyone. I mean, just by seeing everyone here in the crowd, other people want to see this kind of stuff too. So... Um, before we begin, uh, just a little bit about us, Oz DeFi. You can go and see a lot of the stuff that we've got, which is at defi.org.au. But if you go to that website now, you'll realize that I've crashed the website. It's okay. Um, Wix is onto it. So within 24 hours or so, it should go back up. Basically, what I was trying to do, we ran a Spaces the other week and, uh, or the other day, and we had created a calendar a calendar of all the different DeFi, NFT, metaverse type events so that if you're in a different state at this time of the month, this day, whatever it is, there's a calendar there for you rather than having to go to Meetup, Eventbrite and all the different ones out there. So it doesn't have exactly everything on there, but the major players are there, NFT Melbourne, NFT Sid, all the others and stuff. Um, but uh, whilst trying to put that on the website because there was a lot of demand for it, I ended up crashing it before coming here, but it'll be back up. But on the DeFi.org website, you've got some resources. There's a getting started guide for anything in the Web3 space. On that note, can I get a show of hands here who already knows or is doing or researching or working in the Web3 space? It's about half. Or maybe a bit more than half, actually. I saw some hands slowly go up after, so, so that's OK. Um, but anyways, for those of you that are, congratulations. You are part of the future. The, How many of you are DGENs? Who classifies themselves as a DGEN? Okay. okay, we expect more hands next time, okay? <laughs> Some up the back. Um, so, but anyway, no, this is very interesting, and uh, we're, we're going to do much more of these. Enough about hearing from me, because you hear, you'll hear me talking with these guys as we do the panel. Um, but I'm going to introduce you now to a man who... Uh, you're going to see a lot more of who we wouldn't be able to do this without our partners and friends at Sensan, Peter. Thank you. Um, so uh, really great to see so many people turn up. So um, uh, we've, uh, we're in a, a startup based out of Melbourne. We've uh, got an earth tech company which has been focused on bringing all agriculture technology together and... We've been running that for about four or five years and that product's going to be launching later on this year. But we are launching a new Web3 product and uh, that's focused on creating a carbon trading platform that's utilising all of the data we do out in agriculture. So we're really focused on that new product at the moment. We've built a new team together and we bumped into the Oz DeFi guys who wanted to run an event out here. We were looking for a meetup and we couldn't quite find one that was regular enough. So... You know, Mark insisted that we run it and, make our you own. know, make our own. That's right. So uh, really, really pleased to see everybody here. Um, and, uh, yeah, hope to tell you more about it as we go through. Perfect. Shane? Hello. Um, my name is Shane Verner. I'm from Fireblocks. Does it sound like it's on? Hello. Let's no. do this one. My name is Shane Verner. I'm from Fireblocks. Um, quick story. I, I threw my um, card on the bar a couple of weeks ago. 
in the establishment hotel in, in George Street, Sydney. And I cornered Arturo. I'd never met him before. I said, you know, mate, I'm, you know, I do this. And he said, well, I do this. And I said, oh, well, okay, we've got something in common. I just have a client who's doing this really cool carbon credit, ag tech, marketplace, groovy thing. And he said, send San, Peter Moulton. So yeah. that's that guy. Oh, sorry, Shay. Just... Oh, it's right. not working? It is, but you got to talk. Oh, right. i got to talk yeah. loud like this? Yeah. Like deep. Can like you hear me now? Yeah. Love okay. song dedication. It was a great story. Did anybody hear it? <laughs> something, something drinks establishment. Yeah. This one might be okay now. Sorry. No. Anyway. There we go. Um, <laughs> I met Arturo a couple of weeks ago. It was a great story. Yeah. <laughs> Can you appear as well? If you want um, to hear the story, you've got to buy the NFT. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what I... <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Shane. I kicked off Fire Blocks in Australia about eight months ago. It's been an amazing ride. Um, Fire Blocks, for those of you who don't, who don't know what AGAR are from, kind of like the AWS for crypto. Uh, we are an institutional security organization um, three years uh, since inception. That might be in my intro. Guys, just remember that name, Fire Blocks, all one word. You're going to need it. Look it up. If you're going to build in this space, you have to look it up. We'll tell you more about it later. Arturo. I met this guy a few weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so I, same as Mark, wear a few different hats. And I think that the, the main hat that I, got, that I want you guys to, to, to take with yourselves is, is that I'm not centralized which is uh, a venture studio. We focus on Web3 projects. One of these projects is our, is our community engagement, which is the Oz DeFi community. And- uh, You're in our project right now. Yeah, exactly. Congrats. <laughs> and um, uh, we, our, our job is to help projects come from idea to actual product or to actual community. And from our point of view, that, that's it's a wide, range of different things but more importantly it's community building and it's technology that solves an issue that the community actually has right you, you find the purpose and on the technology side we're pretty agnostic but we do work a lot with starkware and have written a bunch of contracts on starknet and and you know we we're really into that l2 space so if you guys want to talk about that reach out and uh, i'm happy to to yeah waste hold the mic time. up hold the mic up there you go. Yeah, two, two, yeah, exactly. yeah, that's it. We've, we've all been tested. We probably don't have COVID, but, you know, we'll see. But um, if you haven't heard of Starknet, you might have heard of Immutable, right? Yeah. Hands up who's heard of Immutable. Yeah. There you go. They're building on Starknet as well, so it's good tech, right? So we've got some good friends over there. Um, yeah, that's me. That's it. Thank you, Arturo. He goes by the name Numbers. Um, on he, the Discord, yeah. Yeah, yeah the Oz DeFi Discord. The math I, genius. I rant a lot. Um, what's that movie, Goodwill Hunting, the janitor that does all the math stuff? That's that's him. I do the um, <laughs> and apples, if he likes apples. Uh, so anyway, that's that's our panel. So we're going to have a panel today. It's going to be a really cool topic, which is uh, DeFi and crypto. Is it dead? And judging by the room here, the answer is no. So thank you very much. That's it. <laughs> but no, we will have more. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge because... We've been coming down to Melbourne a little bit. We haven't had a chance that we, we've been very fly in, fly out. So we haven't had a chance to really run these events. And it was kind of hard because if we're only going to come down for a bit, let's do a few drinks. And I met some great people over that. They've joined the Discord, which you, you can still access off our Twitter account. So even though the website's down, A-U-S-D-E-F-I. That is us on Twitter, OzDefi. So follow that. There's a link tree. It's got all the links that I haven't broken. Thank you. Um, so join the Discord. Um, we, we can see quite a few familiar faces here that have joined us. PD, who, where, where's PD? And there we go. He was one of our first members from Melbourne and came down to join us, and he's doing some amazing things. As we do more of these meetups, you're going to hear from him and the projects he's working on. Um, and he was part of a delegation that went to the US to go to Consensus and NFT NYC. Steve Vallis up the back and Rochelle, thank you for coming down. Uh, Blockchain Australia, guys. So um, Steve and Rochelle are there from that. Follow them on Twitter so you can see the awesome uh, delegation that they were able to pull together. And uh, I'm sure if you get to chat with them, you'll hear some amazing insights, okay? Uh, Greg, 
always around. Whether we're in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane, we keep bumping into you. I don't know if it's us following you or the other way around and Ronnie, um, but we love you guys and love your support. And then um, everyone else that I've met in the room that I've only spoken to on Discord, but now I got to kind of meet in real life. You guys are amazing. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, more thank yous to come, but we're going to get into the, to the panel. Okay, so there's a couple of questions we're going to go through. Uh, and if anyone wants to ask anything from the audience as well, just put your hand up. If I see someone straining after a while, like we'll, we'll head over to you. But no, we, we will get some questions and interactivity from the audience. But the DeFi and crypto thing is it dead. I think that um, for me, it's not. We're only just getting started. We need events like this to kind of happen and stuff. But uh, let's hear from the panelists. So the first question is, um, we're all hearing from the media that crypto... It's, it's in a winter kind of thing. And whilst I decide who's going to answer the first question, uh, we're hearing it's all a crypto winter, but what has the last uh, couple of weeks and months taught us and, and where to from here? Uh, who wants to answer that one first? Who wants to go? Shane. I'll have a crack. No. Oh. Yeah. I'll have a crack. That's better. Um, it, it's been an interesting sort of whatever it is, six weeks, eight weeks since USTD pack. Uh, our organization actually uh, was founded in the last crypto winner. We, uh, our three founders are all ex-Israeli military intelligence dudes and, and they were called in to do the forensic audit of the hack between, of the hack, can you hear me Adelaide? I can't get it any closer. Can I try it now? Yeah. Oh my God, it's sensitive. It's, it's very, very special. Um, so, so yeah, in, um, in 2019, our three co-founders were called in to do a forensic audit of a hack uh, that happened from the North Korean hackers to three South Korean exchanges, $200 million worth of Bitcoin gone. So, sorry, which one? Yeah, 2018 it was. Ronan? No, Ronan was more recently. More recent, no. Older. No, it's, a, it's an older one. Uh, <laughs> no. And so they recognise an opportunity to secure the blockchain and here we are a, a few years later. Um, so I, I think great opportunity is going to come out of this. We have seen organisations who trafficked in, let's call it malfeasance or, um, or willful uh, misleading of investors, we saw Ponzi schemes, we've seen them go away. Um, but as a consequence of that, we've seen, I think, a contraction of, of what we'd call the traditional crypto play. But in, in our experience, we've seen a, a, an explosion in the institutional side of the world. Um, major organisations, both locally throughout APAC and indeed globally, have started to come in and do um, really interesting things that I think we're going to talk about soon. Uh, in this space. So I think there's great opportunity. I think the fringe dwellers that we can well do without uh, are disappearing and disappearing at pace. And I think there's a real cementing of serious business-minded people um, at, at an institutional level going and doing things that, that we're all going to profit from. Thank you. Uh, Arturo? It's got to be that way. Okay. Do you have some thoughts on this? So I, I come from TradFi. Um, I used to run exotic derivatives at RBS and Merrill Lynch in London. And I was, um, I was at RBS in 08 when the shit hit the fan properly. Uh, and um, it's really interesting because what I would say is that it's all happened before. Uh, it happened in regulatory space. It happened outside of regulated space. Um, it happens, right? Uh, now, I think that the key takeaway here is that you put your money where you understand, right? Uh, I, I'm not adverse to, to taking risk. Uh, I never really understood UST. Now I understand why I didn't understood it. <laughs> uh, but even, even having worked in the industry for a long time, I thought, oh, well, maybe it's because it's a crypto thing. It's not. You can't live by that excuse that, oh, it's a crypto thing, therefore it'll work. It doesn't. Risk is risk. If you don't understand it, don't take it. Uh, so I think that if people kind of take that approach, then uh, we're going to have a much better cycle next time. 
Uh, I think that uh, my microphone's working. <laughs> um, well, no. I know. I've got the, the microphone touch. Um, I, I think that when you get those bull runs, that there's a lot of the opportunistic projects that come along that try to capitalise on that run. And when the winters come, they all get cleared out. So uh, we were around, we were very early in the 2017 period and every man and his dog was busting our chops to do some ICO was the word at the time, right? And we just didn't have a, a conviction about what that product was going to be. So we didn't jump on said bandwagon. I was an enthusiast, but I wasn't making a product in that space. So I think the winters give you the opportunity for those projects to get cleaned out so that, you know, the fire blocks has come along and then a company in our situation, we engage fire blocks and that we can build on top of that. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we don't need to do. So you keep on getting those extra layers that compound with time. So uh, I think that those things just clear out over these winters. And will algorithmic stable coins clear out as well? Arturo's Are they dead? A, Arturo's got a phrase instead of algorithmic stable coins. What do you call it? Algorith algorithmic shit coins. It's algorithmic shit coins. There you go. <laughs> so we will probably not see that too too much. Mark with a deep voice. Um, so the next question, considering that this space is building blocks, right? And that's the key. Like if you've ever built anything in Web2, um, if people aren't open sourcing things, then yeah, great, you've got to start from scratch in some ways, but where there are these uh, open source projects, like I mean, even the stuff that Arturo and I do, we don't have to build layer one, someone built it. We can build on top of that and or we're building on layer two, so we're stepping up another level. But just from where you guys stand, what are you seeing in terms of what is being built? Whether it is Web3 projects or even if it's like part of the way, like Web 2.5, um, Arturo, do we, what do we start? I think I'm a bit biased here. Um, I, um, I'm starting to see much more utility. Uh, and uh, that's, that's obviously a really good thing. I mean, Sensand is, is a, a perfect example of what utility is in terms of blockchain. I think that Fireblocks is also uh, an amazing example of what utility is, although Fireblocks is more of a, of a derivative of, of being able to, to power that utility, if I may put it that way. Um, I think, I think that, um, uh, a lot of the, the, the things that we're going to go, that we are going to see going forward are, are things that, uh, people are really going to question, right? As in, do we really need it? And, uh, that's, that's, it's, it's really important, right? Part of that questioning is going to be, does it really need to be blockchain? Does it really need a token? And uh, if it does have a token and you're shilling it, make sure that you highlight the risks. Because if you're a builder, I think that the responsibility to a large extent is on you. People that want to get into it are probably going to buy it anyway, right? So just make sure that they understand what they're getting into. Um, I see some themes emerging. Um, well, not, not emerging, particularly if I can just talk about the Australia New Zealand experience. Um, I think there's four remittances and and how people in third world countries transfer money between each other. I, I, I see as an extraordinary thing for the greater good. Um, I had no idea how poorly Western Union treated those that didn't need to be treated so poorly. When, you know, when they wanted to send a hundred bucks from the oyster farm in Brisbane back home to Tonga, I didn't realise our Western Union took 50. Um, uh, un until I started in this gig. And, th and then there's a, a lot of organisations that I'm speaking to, um, that we are, we're speaking to across Australia and New Zealand that are addressing that. I think ESG um, in the carbon market across all sorts of different layers of institutional Australia and New Zealand are, are being addressed and addressed at pace. I think cross-border payments is, um, whilst not the sexiest thing in the world, I accept that. Um, but is an, uh, a, a market sector that has been uh, dominated by a couple of very large companies, interestingly owned by the banks, that's changing. And, and those banks are leaning into an existential crisis that they're facing today. And if they don't solve this problem, some a whole bunch of different smart fintechs are gonna eat their lunch. Um, and probably most interestingly, I think from, from my own personal experience is the tokenization of real world assets. Uh, I was in a meeting two weeks ago that I was telling Arturo about where a, a gentleman who's 
uh, a, a luminary in, in the financial world um, in, in Australia, said, I want to tokenize a, a jumbo jet. And I thought, why, dude? And, and, and I sort of had to think about why. And you think about that fractionalization of that asset. And if you created a lane between Melbourne and Sydney and Central Freight that way, and each of us had access to that financial instrument, I think it's an extraordinary opportunity. Um, they're, they're the four themes that I see. Getting rugged. Am I getting rugged? Try, try again. Four themes. Four themes. No. no. Four themes. Four themes. I finished for him. Hey, hey, um, I think that in our situation, we are looking at what blockchain can enable. So not all parts of blockchain are always going to get utilized. And in our case, we're not going to be decentralized, right? So how was that? Oh, my back. Um, we're not going to be decentralized, but there's other parts of it that we do use to apply to the business problem that we're solving. And I think that companies need to take that approach. And I'll wear the company hat. Um, you can use these these tools and this technology to solve your specific problem. And I think that needs to be the focus. Like, what is the problem that you're trying to solve and using it to solve it rather than finding the other way around? Like, that was the ICO thing where everyone wanted to tokenize everything so they could capitalize on it. But you've got to come from it solving the problem and using the right tools to do it. Why blockchain, I think, you use, right? So if there's a reason to use it, then that's the case that you should apply it. Hi, we've got a question from the audience. Just while I have you on the spot. Um, so you're talking about uh, blockchain and how do you explain to other not blockchainers people how you actually explain the need of the blockchain? Why blockchain? Why blockchain? Yeah, because even like a supply chain, for example, they already exist. They already have lots of different opportunities and lots of different softwares. They actually run a su supply chain. But how do you explain they need to go to the blockchain? Well, you shouldn't need to, right? You, you should be what talking what about... What do you mean you need to? Well, they don't know about you. That's really, that's a really new. That's no, I, really I, new. No, I understand. But, you're, you know, I'm not coming up and advocating that blockchain is going to solve everything. You apply... If someone in supply chain has a particular problem, they should use the right tool to solve that challenge rather than coming up and shilling that blockchain is going to solve everything and we're going to tokenize everything. So. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not talking about that blockchain will solve everything. Of course, they have a problem. Mm. <laughs> they want to have they, they have a problem they want to solve and they come to you and saying like, okay, so this is the blockchain, the, the problem they can solve. However, you still need to educate uh, some industries and niches that the blockchain can solve the problem. So they even actually turn over and say, okay, so I will consider blockchain technology that can solve my problem. Is it clear? How would you say to those industries that's blockchain, the, the problem they have, the blockchain can solve it? Well, I think that the problem product needs to actually solve the problem inherently first, right? And Blockchain is part of that solution. I don't think that you can't come into it and pitch that it's the solution to everything. So I think it comes from solving the problem first. And if blockchain's the right tool, it'll sell itself. You don't need to advocate that a blockchain is better than a database or better than something else. It's this is going to materially do something better than the way it was done before. And the value speaks for itself. So, sure. Absolutely. I'll just uh, I'll, I'll give a, uh, another interpretation to, to, to that. Um, we, we spent quite a lot of time thinking about why blockchain. And um, one of the standard questions is, what can you do in blockchain that you cannot, or let, let me put it this way, what can you do in Web3 that you cannot do in Web2? In reality, it's as, a, as, a, as an absolute answer, very few things. As a more nuanced answer, many things can be done easier through blockchain than through Web2. Uh, let me give you two examples. Uh, one of them is movement of liquidity and, and transparency of liquidity. Right? It's a very general term, but in reality, that's what blockchain does for you. It, it simplifies the transaction of value. 
not not so much your assignment of value, but you know, understand the nuance. It's it's about the the yeah. I don't think this is working that well. Sure, okay, sure, okay. It's about the the way in, in which you can transact it. It's a it's the way in which you can show that you have the money, i.e., escrows, uh, and without the need of having uh, you know a bunch of lawyers and accountants to set all of that infrastructure up for you, right? Uh, the other thing is it's a, it's a toy example, and as an engineer, I, I love toy examples because they kind of help you understand like the essence of of, of many different things. Imagine that you want to buy um, a world, uh, a round the world ticket. And imagine also, there's a lot of imagining here. Imagine that you can actually buy tickets as NFTs from, from various different vendors, right? Within blockchain, we have something that is, that is quite profound, which is uh, atomic composability at a transactional le level. Now, what that means is that you can effectively, within one transaction, say, I want to buy these NFTs from all of these different vendors and either all of them go through or none of them go through in one execution. If I were to try to do that in Web 2, it, it would be impossible because I'd have to connect to all of these different web APIs across all of these different companies. They'd have to give me a price for about five minutes and if one of them screws up, then it's not happening, right? I, I, th there is going to be an error within that execution. That does not happen in blockchain. And the reason for that is because when you develop something on blockchain, you're not only developing something on a global computer, it's actually a global runtime of shared memory. Now, if for the developers, I think that means something. For the non-developers, the difference is basically you're running something on one single machine versus you're running something on a hundred different machines that have to talk to each other in an efficient way, which just doesn't happen. And just to quickly wrap up, hopefully, if my microphone works. Um, I think that blockchain is also an opportunity to have business model innovation, not just technical innovation. And that changes the, that changes the opportunity to solve whatever that problem, but then you've still got to sell it. Well, we, we can keep going offline. We'll we've, the end. We, we've got another question. I mean, I'll add a little bit to that. If, you, if someone's going to build something in a Web2 space, they build this amazing app, then they decide to rug, or not rug, they just decide, sorry, non-Web3 people, they decide to walk away from the space and leave the project. That project dies. If I put it on the blockchain, it just continues to live as long as the blockchain is there. So immediately, there is that, that is one big thing why a blockchain is a big thing. But we can talk more. We'll, we'll talk more so that we can keep the, the thing going. Someone else had a question here. Do you still have... Yeah? Actually, Olga, I... Hello, Olga. <laughs> Um, yeah, I had that question too, and yeah. looking at the security token and utility token and just doing the comparison um, as to why is it that we need some of the projects in that space. Well, there is no need for uh, projects in that space in my uh, pea brain mind <laughs> um, because they're a, a security token. But let's go back to Ed. I've got a question from a friend of mine. <laughs> who's a developer um, and that works pretty close in DeFi protocol um, and deep in Web3. So the question that he asks or is a lot of people come into this space and it's usually about the, the token price and not necessarily the utility. With the way the, the market cycle is, um, i.e. in terms of the, this market we've got, um, we're finding more and more investors are leaving the space, but a lot more developers are actually building the space. What's your thoughts on that? Biddle now. You said Bill, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is... Um, this is the right time, and the reason is because if you're able to deliver a product before the next bull, then you can properly sell during that bull. Um, but um, yeah, I think um, I think the other thing is also that uh, it's it's a really interesting conundrum the the liquidity that is available on the tokenization of your project, and uh, that 
if your project doesn't generate revenue, if it lives off the income, let's put it this way, of you selling the tokens, then you are in a lot of trouble when those tokens are not valuable. On the other hand, if you actually have utility and you're generating revenue outside, very much like a Uniswap or something like that, then you have a better chance of, of surviving. Uh, so that gives you gives you an idea. This this times like these really give you an idea about what the what it is that you really need to think about when you're building that protocol. Speculation is just going to get you so far, right? So you've got to build something that actually solves the problem. Utility is the definition of that, right? So if you've made something that has utility, it has use, then the business case for it will stack up and it will give you a return. When you see the bull phase is, is everyone's just investing on the speculation that they're hoping that they're going to ape into something, right? So you've just got to go back to basics, which is solving the problem, not worrying about the, you know, hopeful capital growth or shilling something out. You just get back to solving the problem, guys. Like build something that works, that does the thing it's meant to do. I think they answered the question really nicely. I'll, I'll just challenge the premise of the question. Maybe not challenge, just put a little bit of colour. We, we divide our market up globally into three sectors, crypto, custodian and uh, TradFi. Crypto shrunk quite a bit. Custodian shrunk quite a bit. TradFi almost doubled last quarter. So whilst their, their investors might nece not necessarily be coming from the crypto or custodian space, they're, they're really coming from the TradFi space now. One man's loss is another man's opportunity or another institution's opportunity, it seems. <laughs> um, speaking of instos and, the, you know, the, the big brother uh, that's out there watching all of us now, where are the cameras? Um, what can governments do to support the community? I probably phrased that really poorly. I apologise. But, you know, if you weren't aware of it here, in Australia, the Treasury Department put out a uh, response paper, a consultation paper, sorry, called uh, for CASPERS. Um, I can't remember what they stood for, but it's not to do with ghosts. Uh, but given, you know, the, what the government is doing, uh, do you guys want to talk about what can they be doing more to support this community? Shane. Hello, Steve Vellis. <laughs> Blockchain Australia, everybody. I just cornered him and bored the shit out of him for 20 minutes. He doesn't want to hear it all again. I'll, look, uh, I'll, I'll be really quick. Um, 2025 is the timeline that our various regulators have have outlined um, as their, their, their target goal. I don't think that's acceptable with, with greatest respect. If you see what Japan announced yesterday, Maz in Singapore, Europe last week, you know, we, we are an extraordinary market in this blockchain and crypto, and I'm talking Australia. Um, interestingly, 30% of Australians have engaged with crypto and only 7% of Kiwis. Does anybody understand why? It doesn't make any sense, right? No. They're cool. Um, Kiwis are cool. <laughs> Maybe. No. <Okay. laughs> um, but uh, but in, in, in Australia, we run the threat. If we live true to that 2025, Steve, stop making eye contact, through that 2025 um, date, uh, I, I fear that we will be left behind and it will cost us jobs and opportunity and money and, and all sorts of good things. I, what's wrong with next year? I, I really do. And it doesn't have to be perfect, just a light regulatory wrapper. I, I would love, and I know my clients would love, just to give them surety and and maybe eliminate some of the um, the fringe dwellers in the industry. Steve, I'd love to give you this. Can I give Steve the microphone? Go, go, go. Here's me running. Five, four, three, two. Steve. Uh, the, the, the thing I think everyone needs to understand, and this is a byproduct of many thousands, literally thousands of conversations is uh, as an industry generally, we don't appreciate other people's context. And the reality of government is they are risk averse, as they should be. Their job is to protect or otherwise provide constraints so things don't uh, become sort of an unfettered free-for-all. That's a challenge. Um, the other thing to understand is efficiency is a much sexier word than disruption. The reality is if you can make a process better, you're more likely to have traction in a room than the person that says, I'm going to disrupt your industry. Because disruption says risk and challenges. And that domain experience is absent, I can tell you, in every segment of every industry or government conversation I have consistently. We sit here in a room of domain experts and say, how come they don't get it? Because outside this room, very few people get it. So it's sort of incumbent on us to say, uh, we understand your context much more readily. I, I have some optimism. Uh, I think Shane's right in terms of a natural sort of timeline, but if we can make a case that says, this is something we should be moving to at a faster clip, the reality there is, uh, as they're upskilled, 
and the teams are being built out. Um, teams within Treasury have gone from basically nothing to very significant numbers. Um, when Rochelle and I were in uh, the US, we met with the Fed Reserve. Who knew that the Fed Reserve in the US would want to meet with Australians talking about blockchain and crypto? We had 14 people who participated in a meeting to talk to us about what we're doing in Australia. So there are green shoots, but uh, the takeaway generally is uh, understand other people's context a little bit more because the truth of technologists is they say, I can fix your problem, and they don't ask the question, do you want your problem fixed first? So that's, uh, that's uh, one of the takeaways. So Steve, us as a community, what, what can we do? Apart from call your local member, what can we do? So there's a, there's a belief that if you can convince your politicians, the job gets done. But it's not the case. I mean, the reality is the politicians are fed information from the departments that have to give consideration to these issues. So right now, uh, we talked about the consultation. Um, it's been a dense consultation at, at first instance. It will continue. So if you have views that you need to and want to communicate, um, Treasury is open to that conversation. You know, the ATO is just starting a review through the Board of Taxation. APRA, who regulates banks, is just starting their roadmap review. ASIC is attuned to this because the reality is anything related to scams or otherwise need to be uh, need to be given consideration. I'm just reeling off all the regulators, but they're all in train. The ACCC just released a scam report. I spoke to them the day after they released it. They need to be convinced that it's not all bad actors because that's the signalling from people that don't know the space. They say it's all a scam, so treat it as a job lot. It's on, it's on us to say no. Scammers, industry participants, don't conflate the... Uh, uh, the two, and Austrac, who I spoke to today, understand that their primary role is to stop money launderers, um, uh, nefarious and bad actors from participating in this. They're also upskilling at, at pace. So that's basically the suite of all the regulators. And if you think government talks to each other, you're kidding yourselves. The reality is you have to have these conversations six times to six different departments. So uh, persistence and don't take it personally would be my advice, uh, Shane. You heard it right here. The government does not talk to one another. Thank you, Steve. No, no, that's not the takeaway. The takeaway is that your voice is far more important than you think in this space. Your opinions, your views. Government in this space. I mean, we've been involved in finance uh, here in Australia and also I work in the UK with Arturo. Um, yeah, it's far closer in terms of what they're trying to do to get it to what is going on in industry, what projects are doing as well. They are actively talking um, to those people, which has been a very, uh, you know, pleasant surprise. Uh, Peter, what do you think about all this? I'm just going to keep it short and sweet. Like, we are in the ground level trying to go through this process of getting financial services licences getting regulated. We want to trade Australian carbon credit units, which is a financial instrument, so you have to have financial licensing, and that's just incredibly onerous. So, and it's even harder when you don't have clear guardrails or a lot of things that you can and can't do to in blockchain because there's just no definition. So um, it adds a little bit of extra complexity and we get advice about Singapore and co. So, oh, and uh, yeah, so we're just going through that process. So more definition would be great. Sorry. And if you Pre like response papers, I mean, you don't have to answer it once, Arturo, and I did twice, right? So <laughs> just for fun. Um, but sorry, was there a question? Yeah. Please. Oh, yeah, you, I will go to you next. Yes. Yeah. Um, just talking about licences and being regulated in terms of this space, we have a lot of NFT artists out there that don't have that that background. Um, what is your advice for them? Are, are they going to have to get licences because they have a, a project in the space? I mean, what does that look like? Uh, look, specifically for art in NFTs, I don't think that qualifies for needing licensing in general. Like, we're in a specific space where things that we want to do fall under regulatory requirements. So I think it needs to be applied. You, you don't need licensing for things if it's not under certain regulatory requirements. So um, in our case, we want a little bit of defined regulation so that we know what we can and can't do in certain markets and certain products. But that's not always going to be the case, particularly in an NFT art project. It's, it doesn't require licensing, to, from my view. I don't know if anyone else feels differently, but... I think the ATO will. Oh, well, yeah, the ATO. Yeah, the ATO has an opinion on it. They're going to have a real... Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. Yeah. Um, I think that um, uh, it's, it's completely... Accurate. Like I, I would, I would back that in terms of the art, and uh, I think that Steve made a, a very valid point. Where the question, instead of asking what the what the government should do, it's kind of like what we should do, uh, and 
reality is that government's view on regulation is based on what crypto or blockchain is right now. Right now, it is kind of a shit show, right? Because everybody's just selling a token and most of these tokens are useless. So do they want to regulate Dogecoin? Hell yes. Does it add any value? No, not really. Now imagine if blockchain and, and tokens were out there, but from a utility use case, first of all, right? Take gold, for example. Gold is not a regulated asset. Why not? Well, probably because it had a utility within society far, far before regulation was, a, was an actual thing, right? If you want regulators to change their view on what it is that they're regulating, you need to change their view by actually building utility so that they don't come out and say, or rather, so that they come out and say, well, we can't really regulate this thing as if it were a financial asset because then it'll, it, it would be detrimental for innovation. They don't understand what innovation is in terms of blockchain. We need to show that to them. It's not their job. It's ours as builders, right? That's right. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question over here, and I know there's like a lot of questions. We'll, we'll go around and, yeah, four, four questions, five. Anyway, um, so, sorry, what was your name? Anthony has a question here, guys. Hi, guys. Um, my question is generally on DeFi tokens. Uh, based on the, the Howey test, um, a security is basically an investment of money, second, in a common enterprise, third, a reasonable expectation of money, and fourth, derived from effort of others. Based on that definition, do you think the people who buy DeFi token are either in denial or they are um, ludicrous about the fact that they are actually buying security with the expectation of profit? How do you interpret that? I, there are so many different types of tokens. Uh, it really depends on the tokenomics. I mean, some tokens are completely decentralized uh, and there you could, I mean, you, you could just argue that there is no human intervention. You can't really, regulation is, it's control over an action. You're not actually regulating an asset, you're regulating the action upon that asset, right? It's selling it in a specific way, it's investing it in, into it in a specific way. Uh, how can you regulate something like Uniswap, right? You, you, you have no recourse towards it. If you burn those private keys, it's going to be there forever. So how do you deal with a scenario like that? Uh, but then you have other, other DAOs where they are not decentralized at all. And you have a lot of centralization risk in terms of how they're governed. And yeah, even in those scenarios, you probably will, could be regulated, I think. True, there is, there, 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 decentralization is multifaceted. Right, you have the, 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 the technological aspect and then you have the cultural aspect or the human aspect of how, how it's run, right? But if, if the lab goes away, the pools are still gonna be there yeah, until you forever. The value of Uniswap is the, the liquidity pools. Yeah, the guys, guys, sorry, sorry, guys, sorry, sorry, sorry. if we're gonna if we're gonna have a back back and forth, let's get it on the mic and stuff. But can we actually pause on that one and actually get another question? It's a great question and it's something that people need to know because you can't just work in this space and do stuff in this space with thinking that oh, you know, it's decentralized. It's you know, it's living over there. Like I'm here in Australia, but my customers are in somewhere else or in another country. You're still going to be affected by it here. You've got to really under, get an understanding of it and whether that's through coming to events like this and learning a little bit more. But we can, we'll can we have more of a, a conversation after just so we can get around the room. Um, we're only 45 minutes behind, but that's okay. Uh, question. Hey, guys. My name is Josiah. Um, I'm building a DeFi platform called CoinPlants with my co-founder. Um, and there's a lot of people here that I think are, are really smart and building really cool projects. Um, in the blockchain and slash DeFi space. And I wanted to ask you guys, what do you think are some of the challenges generally with DeFi in the industry at the moment um, that, you know, people in this room that could, could take on and build solutions for? Great question. That wasn't planned. You weren't planted, were you? No. It was a great question. And um, I, I wanted to answer the first half of it and I didn't want to answer the second half of it. <laughs> Yeah, one of the challenges, we were touched on some of the challenges. I, I, I think the malfeasance that, that, um, that was announced yesterday that we saw leaked in the press. Um, but the, the, the broad security. Really? Uh, is, it, is it just me? No, you're fine, yeah. 
uh, the broad security challenges that we all face, um, but the go-to-market challenges is what you were actually referring to. And I'm surrounded by gentlemen that are much better placed to answer that. He says copping out generally. That's true. That's a total handball. Yeah. Do, you want, do you want to have a go first? Uh, yeah, go. go. Um, it's a product market fit problem, right? So um, specifically with regards to DeFi, um, we haven't spoken publicly about what it is that we're doing, right? So I don't want to talk too much about a general thing, but from our perspective, um, DeFi has a lot of value that it can provide to all sorts of in people in the market. And in our situation, I just want to speak about ourselves in this lens, that we take the view that you've got to give people the ability to do the things that you're talking about. And it's incumbent on us as the entrepreneurs, as the innovators, to create things that the market wants. And that's a product market fit problem. So um, at an institutional level, there's a bit of a different answer. Um, if you want to get a bit philosophical and you go, hey, what about Terra the last six weeks and 3AC and all of those things? Well, it's so interconnected. That's a big structural problem that is tracking through that market. But I think the market will get more resilient because of situations like what just happened. So um, speaking again from Sensand, we're just going to focus on making sure that what the thing that we do in DeFi actually adds value to the users that we are trying to service. Um, I, I think that um, Peter is, uh, is right, but there are different ways about it. Uh, Peter is special because many reasons. Agreed. <laughs> uh, Peter knows his market extremely well. He knows his tech, but he knows his market. Therefore, product market fits can happen behind closed doors because he knows exactly what the clients need. Not everybody has that, that luck. If you don't, most of you don't. I don't. Build openly. Build openly, get your community behind you. Your community will tell you what they need. And uh, more often than not, what you have in your head is not what people need. And if you're open to it, they will, they, they, they will, they will guide you. And, and you know that when you're out there, the product is being used when it's ready, perhaps even before that because you have an alpha state, you're on testnet, you're getting the feedback, get as much information as possible from people around you virtually. If you're okay with being naked and afraid, then you probably can build in DeFi. So just to say, <laughs> um, so we had a gentleman here. Did, is your question still relevant to, to this? No, no, uh, no, let me get your mic to, no. no uh, more relation to the government. So okay, I'll, I'll we'll circle back. In, in We've got another question at the back from the gentleman with the scuff. Hello, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for your attendance tonight. Uh, my name is Paul Sarablis. I'm a broker at Caleb and Brown. So I live this stuff each and every day and uh, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts. We've heard a lot about regulation and where this industry is directing. So my, the, my last few weeks have been dominated by Celsius, Terra Luna, A3. It's been significant amount of fear with my clients in the market. But given yourselves uh, a, a mix of backgrounds as well as being involved in DeFi, what are your thoughts on self-regulation going forward? I, I have seen a market shift towards centralizing and self-regulating, particularly with Celsius, with holding, with, with holding withdrawals. But I wanted to get your take on what the industry is doing when there is this gap in the market at this time. That is a great question because it actually leads into the next question, which is about how to get this space more mainstream. So if you want to start from, do you want to talk about that or Shane or Peter? Uh, I'll, I'll be really quick. Uh, thanks for being such an awesome customer. Um, <laughs> to customers. I, I think it's cancer. You know, quite simply, I, I think what Celsius did um, destroys faith in all of their investors and, and half the industry. Uh, it, it can't work. That's why we've got to have some sort of light regulatory wrapper to make us as consumers and us as industry participants safe and, and feel whole and, and willing to throw the shit at it. Peter? I think we were debating something similar to this reasonably recently. Um, 
So Sam Bankman Freed backstopped backstopped all of this. Hello, am I back? Yeah. Um, backstopped the liquidity for a lot of these products and protocols. And I think that thank you. Jeez, this is good, isn't it? Um, <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> um, this is a, it's a really, really confusing, difficult thing, and it's a view that I haven't even fully settled on yet. So, do you think that uh, SBF is acting as a good actor for the market by providing those backstops and providing liquidity, and probably under extremely onerous terms? Um, is that actually a good thing for the industry? That's effectively a self-regulation. Um, he's gotten smashed for it, but. Um, I see it more as positive than negative that he did do that because if you had all of the retail investors go under, then everyone's just going to crack it, right? So it's the, the better of two evils in my view. I would rather have somebody like a benevolent dictator, so to speak, coming in and doing a bit of cover for the market so that it doesn't just completely get flamed and you know, get thrown through the media than letting all of the retail investors get cleaned up because they couldn't do withdrawals out of those funds. We've probably got uh, one. And I, yeah, and I say it with no conviction because it's super new and I'm still thinking it through, but it's a really interesting question and I don't think there's clear answers on it yet about the market self-regulating. Standing here, I kind of feel like an <laughs> audience plan where they've kind of brought their own microphone. You know, it's, it's fun. Um, but we've got one more question here. So we'll do this and then we'll continue, guys, with the, with the panel. So Thanks to the panel. Um, my name's Andrew. Uh, it was just a quick question for Shane, I reckon, on the fire block side. Um, I know in the, regula the regulation framework in Australia that came out, <clears throat> there was a lot in there about having custody onshore. What's your opinion of where, given digital assets, the, a lot of the value proposition is that they're global and um, decentralised. What's your opinion on, <clears throat> if you're an Australian, having your assets custody on shore? Is that something Five Locks is looking at um, to solve or is it even an issue in your? Well, it is an issue because of the large institutional customers care deeply about something called sovereignty. I suspect you can't hear me. Thanks for the question, Andrew. Um, our institutional customers care deeply about something called sovereignty. Uh, it comes up. Uh, there's three big things in a big contract, uh, liability, sovereignty and the third one that I blanked on. Um, but we're talking about sovereignty. Um, uh, sovereignty, because of the way that, and this is a little bit technical and forgive me, but it answers your question really quickly, Andrew. Because of the way that we shard the key, not your keys, not your crypto, we keep two, we put one in IBM Cloud, one in Microsoft Azure, the third one is with you. Therefore, the sovereignty and the ability to complete the transaction is with you. So we, we climb the sovereignty hurdle, so we're for it. Yeah, we think it's incredibly important. It's all certain way. Arturo? Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to ask a question in this case. Oh. <laughs> Let's talk about sovereignty. If um, I understand the concept, right? It's about that ownership. Um, and I kind of go back to my initial statement that from my point of view, the value of blockchain is not ownership, it's transaction. Now, what happens if internet gets cut off from Australia, the rest of the world, you have your own copy of a node, you have your own copy of, you're running your own node, right? <laughs> but that node you know, contains your, your private keys and so forth, but that node gets disconnected from the network. Does it still, does, what the, does the content of that node still have value? Is there, is there, you know, does sovereignty really work that way in a digital space? Where are you in this equation? In the way that we treat, yeah. where are you? Is that what? That's what matters. Yeah. Two separate networks. Now, we'll create the same chain of three. An Australian private chain in that moment, and the chain will continue to work. Awesome. But they're, di but they're different chains. So, which asset are, are you actually owning? So what we're talking about is disconnecting the internet. Huh. You're cutting it off from the rest of the world. So at that point in time, we have to run our own services to service our own blockchain. So, so, so the ownership of the asset is, is, is it's a question mark, right? Well, the ownership of the asset and that, the ownership of the network, it's still, yeah, it's, it's a different network. 
it's the people's network, right? So we choose to keep running it if we want to keep it operating. Yeah, I, I just wonder what what is is it really relevant to have the private keys within your own borders if that's sovereignty or do you have control over that in reality or is it part of the actual blockchain itself because it's a public network where is the private key is what yeah. we care about when yeah. we care about sovereignty yeah. right and and Mike. Oh, Mike. <laughs> where, where is the private key is what we care about when we talk about privacy by the way the third thing was oh, sovereignty the third thing was privacy um, so if the key is with me in Australia, yeah. as opposed to with you in New Zealand, yeah. um, which is a terrible example, um, then then the, so that's what I care about. And that's what the regulatory body will care about and the contract owner will care about when they talk about sovereignty. Mm -hmm. and, and you think about things like BS11 in New Zealand, GDPR, BS11, um, those sorts of things are critical um, at, a, at an institutional level. Uh, guys, I'm sure there's plenty of questions and we will, you know, we'll, we'll have to do, am I getting right? No, I'm okay. So look, um, we, we've got one more question for the panel and then we'll open it up and if people want to do this and get more drinks and stuff like that, we think we can go back and forth. I'm happy to run around and get my fitness up, I'm getting my steps in, thank you. Um, but the, the next question is on, uh, oh sorry, what I was going to say was, if you don't get to ask the question in this space, if you go to the AusDefi Twitter, A-U-S-D-E-F-I, um, AusDefi, there is a link, link tree thing and you can get into our Discord and we can talk more about this. Every Monday, we're going to be, we're, we're going to be, hello, we're going to be doing spaces, Twitter spaces at 5 o'clock or 5.15 every Monday so we can dive into this more if you don't get to ask it here, but definitely grab the guys after. Um, but the next question to round things off, and it kind of goes back to a question that you had there before was, uh, Around, and others have had, around education. Like what's it gonna to take to actually um, get mics at work? What's it gonna to take to get um, people educated in this space that, what's education like in this space? <laughs> Is this gonna work? Um, so I think that, um, I think the companies need to make products that just make it easy to consume and use Web3 as a generalization. It should, the friction is a bit too high. I just use the, would I get my mum to have a MetaMask account test? And it's just way too hard, right? And she'll lose the key, even if she can get it to work. It's just not a good, you know, it's, it's hard, right? Um, that's, a, I guess, at a product at a, a, a personal level. I just want to share a very, very small story about it about education though, and that is that the uh, the institutions, we, we were doing some intern interviews about a year ago, and uh, I asked this question about blockchain, we hadn't had our product yet by the way, and I asked the same question to a few of them, and they all gave me a very, very similar answer, like, you know, you know blockchain good, Bitcoin bad. Um, and it just was the way that the education was sort of churning those people out as well. I don't know if that was someone that might've been here that ended up, you know, sticking on, um, but I think that education at the institutional level, at the universities trickles into this. We as product innovators need to make it easy to consume it. Um, yeah, that's the way that I would approach it. I think that's an excellent answer. Um, I'm a middle-aged white bloke, you probably saw that, and um, I, I come from traditional banking and traditional finance, and I've had middle-aged white guys, my mates, text me every single bad thing that happens in, in our space and it's beyond tedious and I think it's aggressively, willfully ignorant. And I, I, I also think that the cavalry isn't coming. I think it's up to us as a community to, um, to challenge them and to say, read a book and I'll, and I'll, and I'll lead you the way to, to the good books and the good people in this industry and, and continue driving that education because blockchain good, Bitcoin bad, and um, it's all a scam. It is beyond tedious, particularly when when we get to sit in front of uh, incredibly um, entrepreneurial people that are, are breaking new ground in in really worthwhile use cases. I, I think we've got a lot to offer. Um, yeah, Probably let's try. That. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think um, on the one hand, I'm ten tempted to say Finematics. For those of you don't YouTube, that don't know what it is, YouTube it because it explains a lot. Finematics, F I N E, Maddox, uh, one word. Find Maddox or Finematics, yeah. but yeah. And whiteboard crypto. Whiteboard yeah. Crypto is awesome. Yeah. Um, 
Yep, okay. We'll make a list. Uh, but the other one is, um, is understand what risk. Just don't website for it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Wait 24 hours, sorry. Un I would say understand, understand the risks that you expose yourself to, <laughs> right? It's, uh, it's too much to expect from anyone to really dive into the technology, even if you're a technologist, because there's so many different aspects and facets to the whole thing. Um, understand the utility, but more importantly, really understand if you're an investor, then kind of try to figure out what the token is actually doing. Uh, and if you're um, using it, then you know make sure that you understand the, the, the risks in terms of security. You know, uh, does it go down or not? Are you actually locked in or not? Can somebody access your private keys or not? You know, those, those things. So really find, I think it's about finding the right partners and, and help and have those partners help educate you. No, very good answer. Um, you know, you guys have heard the thing, not your keys, not your crypto. If you've heard of soul bound tokens, it's not your soul, not your token. <laughs> and who knows what else there is. There's proof of life coming up next. And, you know, my stand up act will be better next time. But um, just speaking of getting this, and, you know, you, you mentioned like what are, educating the corporates and stuff. We were just, we can't disclose the name of um, the institution, the financial institution, the big financial institution. Don't worry, I'm not going to say the name. Um, but we were running a workshop with these guys today and they're only just getting, they're only just getting started in the space. And so um, Arturo and I, we're, you might see we're wearing, this is going to be a shill, I apologise. We're wearing a, a, a hoodie, says not centralised on there. We, we have a group of different individuals, whether it's legal, it's people that raise capital, it's people that know the tokenomics that have been building in the space that do the NFT art, that do um, the data analytics and analysis like, like I've done, when you realize all the different things that you need and elements involved in um, creating a Web3 product, it really makes um, your eyes open because it's not like, oh, it's easy. I can just, I've followed a tutorial. I can just put my product online and that's going to be it. Well, if you do all of that, as our good friend Harry Dell, who uh, does the tax um, TikTok kind of channel, says uh, he prefers it when customers come to him early because he's usually able to solve um, problems before they end up having them, and especially if they come to him late. Um, and the Val's accounting guys are the same as well. Like, you've got to go to these guys that are providing services in this space early um, to understand things and come to more meetups like this. We're going to open up the floor to more questions because you guys, uh, I think, are itching. Who's, who's got some questions? Did you get another one? Yep. Right over here. Anthony. Uh, the question is on one that actually Arthur Hayes asked, not, not that I asked, is in the time when uh, Bitcoin uh, mining program finishes and Bitcoin's trending towards a uh, store of value as property. So when there's no transaction, miners not going to get paid. So what if everyone's holding Bitcoin like gold? There's no transaction. Where? How is the miner going to protect the network? What is the incentive there? Incentives of Bitcoin, anyone? This might. I don't know, Peter. It's an awfully long time away, but um, there's going to, they'll just, the market, the community will just do an update to the way that the mining mechanism works. It'll probably go to proof of stake or some derivative of that. And they'll, they'll adapt to them because there's a business case behind it, right? So they're, they're not going to let that just stop. That, that's what, 20? Is it, do we think it's 20 years? 100 is it? No, surely. Do I hear 150? 150, yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll adapt. Okay, it's a long way away, but they'll adapt. I think it's so far in the future that no one's even thinking about it, but that's that's what my view is. There's too much of a business case around it. Look, pragmatic. Yeah. Question right here. Okay, so um, I got really into crypto about two and a half years ago and did a lot of research, got totally immersed in thinking, oh my God, this is my thing, I love it. And then I went to my first sort of blockchain education, I don't know, what, a month and a half ago, two months ago, and I sat there and I thought, oh shit, this is not as far advanced as I thought it was. Because I was by myself and I was like really into it, like following the projects, I'm like, yeah, this is great. But I actually got a bit of a rude awakening thinking, oh, this is not mainstream soon. This is quite a long way off, and so I just wanted to ask you, 
how far do you think away it is? We don't have a microphone. I think, and, and it's my observation, I, I've been in blockchain since 2016, crypto since 2018, and Fireblock since the end of last year. Um, and I think we're incredibly early. And I'm, I'm seeing the data um, that, that's produced by our organisation, and we're by far the biggest in this space. And we're not big. We just yesterday we passed 100 million dollars in annual recurring revenue. So we're we're tiny on a global scale. Um, hey, se se second fastest in history behind Slack. Boo, Slack. Um, so we're incredibly early. Yeah, I I, I see. Um, this is the first time in my corporate life where I've been asked to give advice. I'm a sales bloke. Um, it's like, what do you think we should be doing? And I said, Oh my God, there's nobody else in the room. So it's just to your point, we're extraordinarily ordinary. Uh, extraordinarily early. Would you like to Yeah. Well, not like, but, you know, like, as in, you know, institutions are taking it on, but, you know, oh, no, they are. The, the, that ballpark, are we sort of talking 10 years, 20 years? No. Nice <laughs> I, I would like to see this in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, can, can we actually poll the crowd? Yeah. All right. Who thinks, you know, we're going to get some i'm not going to say how much mainstream because the quantum is like oh it all has to be mainstream or it's not at all right but just at least some mainstreamness or whatever that kind of is in your head do you guys see things getting a bit more mainstream in the next zero to two years put your hand up a few very good uh three to five years more five to seven Boom. <laughs> eight to ten I know I haven't really distributed that out evenly. I don't know. Eight to 99, yeah, anyway. Um, no, that's good. Look, put it this way. If we polled again, maybe it's different in a couple of months' time. Once we're out of people's perceptions, I mean, there's a lot of us that weren't even thinking about um, the, the whole, which was the algo shit coin, sorry? Um, what was that called again? Terror. 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 Um, a lot of smart people missed it. Right? They thought, well, look, it doesn't look good. It's probably not the best, but there's a lot of money going into it and stuff, so it's fine. I think this is a good wake up call. So, yeah, we, we'll see. We'll probably do this poll again in, in I, a little I, bit. I, I think that um, what, what blockchain or Web3 looks like when it becomes mainstream is going to be very, very different to what it is right now. So, that's another dimension to, to that question, right? Will it ever become mainstream the way it is? No. Uh, yeah. Can, can I just, yeah. I'll, I'll just want to add something really quickly to your, your question. I think it's going to be really boring. I, I think the thing that's going to be the tipping point is going to be incredibly boring. I think we're going to put Swift, somebody's going to put Swift out of business, or somebody's going to put Western Union out of business. One of those household names that are leaning into that ex existential crisis, they've got to get the blockchain right or they're out of business. I think it's going to be as boring as that. And then all of a sudden, it's commonplace and we all just do it. Sorry. Shane's going to get a letter from from the higher ups at Fireblocks about Western Union. Yeah, he'll, <laughs> yeah his mate's going to be like, what are you saying about me, man? Personal opinion. Yeah. Um, I think it'll be, I think it's mainstream when it's invisible, right? So yeah. um, when you're playing, um, here we go. When you're playing World of Warcraft and you win really difficult to get loot and instead of it just being a picture on your game that, you know, you really, really wanted and you were farming that boss and that raid with 25 of your mates and you actually got it, that used to just be a, a graphic, a line in a database and now you own it. Now, if that was happening now and that, was, that gear, that loot was an NFT and I could trade it or sell it, it's invisible, right? It's just I'm playing a game. I'm not winning an NFT. Right now, we're thinking of it as an NFT. So when it's just, I've got loot, and I can sell that loot or something like that, and it's just what you do, that's when it's mainstream. And that's what you're waiting for. And that's why it's incumbent on us. Hello? There we go. It's incumbent on us to make the products that make it like that. One, Maybe. one more question, guys. And yeah, hang on. Um, so I typically, I'm a security person, IT security. Um, by trade, um, thinking about what happens with Bitcoin encryption, private keys and the like, and I get this question quite a bit being in crypto for a while now, people come to me and go, what about quantum computing and when they break the encryption keys? 
from having a security person on stage. I've never had the opportunity to ask this, so I thought you're you're here. Here you go, Shane. So, awesome. <laughs> what's your what's your thoughts like to to that paradigm? Can you can you explain the paradigm a little bit um, differently? Essentially, maybe? the encryption keys. We've now got quantum computing. They can solve a problem that could be so would take traditional computing of today. 9,000 years to solve, they can solve it in three seconds. Yep. And all of a sudden now our encryption keys that we have to generate on these nodes that we run distributedly among the globe now essentially could be cracked. This is a Stuart question, but yeah. Yeah, it's in, in, all, the, um, in all honesty, mate, I'm not really equipped to answer that question and I can hear all of the engineers that work in Fireblocks laughing at my attempt to. Um, <laughs> you guys are here. Uh, um, I, I worked at IBM when we were deep into quantum and seeing what we could do with it. Um, I'm at Fireblocks now and there we, we have this rich DNA strand that runs it through everything that, that is talking to. This is so frustrating. They, they say a public speaker has to put people through um, boredom and suffering and you get to choose which one. I, I feel like I'm doing the suffering here with this bloody microphone. Oh, mate, thank you. Um, so, yeah, there's this rich DNA strand of, of cyber that runs through everything we do. We're, those guys are all ex-military ex intelligence. They're leaning into these problems all the time. I'm not equipped and they, even if I was, they would hate me to answer it. Do you know what I mean? Without, I'm sorry. Could, with, could I? Can I question that? Because uh, you're in security. Probably. If quantum computing is able to crack private keys, isn't SSL a bigger issue? Yeah. It is. And every bank out it there is. is naked? It is. Yeah. That, that's the point, I think. Look, when they're cracking Bitcoin wallet addresses, they're cracking SSL, they're cracking RSA. It's all done, right? Which means everything is going to have to change again. There's a couple of crypto projects that have made like that are defensible against quantum and theoretically. Um, but I think that there's bigger problems than crypto if that happens, uh, frankly. I would just like to thank you all for equipping the audience here now with the, the conversation to battle those questions when they're asked. Because people ask people that are in cryptocurrency, what about quantum computing? What about AI and all these sort of things? You guys have now given various tool sets from various perspectives and given them the tools to battle those paradigms and, and help transform the conversations we have. And back on the point of talking to government, talking to different businesses, it's really important to speak their language and not necessarily bring it down, but talk about the key things that audience member wants. Transformation doesn't really work. Efficiencies, assurance and governance is what Bitcoin provides when you're talking to government bodies. <laughs> on the panel next, you saw it there. That was not a prepared question, but maybe it was. Um, but, you know, the other thing that you often hear to that point is, what if the internet goes down? Well, your net banking's going down too, bro. You know, like, oh, you're not going to have your NFTs. You're not going to have your Netflix, you know. So there are, it, or, the other one is like um, gaming and NFTs. Like a lot of the gamers, non-NFT kind of folk, were the ones that were really pushing with their documentaries and stuff, hating on NFTs. And it's like, NFTs are bad for the environment. Well, what about, what does gaming, what does a high rig, uh, high whatever spec rig, the, the NVIDIA 3080 that my brother bought the other week or whatever, that puts out a lot more output compared to uh, an average, say, I think it was a Californian home because it was a US study. Um, in a year of just average running, that puts out as much energy output, carbon output as two thirds of, a Californian home or something like that. I don't have the paper here, so sorry, you know, you'll have to believe me. Um, but we do a lot of these links. We have even a document, a living document online that we keep on adding to where people have, um, if it's environmental or if it's the scams or if it's like all of these other um, critiques of crypto that we've been collecting and we put it out there. You can comment on it. You can, um, if you're really interested, I'm open to having people add to it because we need to have these counterpoints. Is crypto the greatest thing since sliced bread? Maybe, but we've got a lot of um, stuff to clean up off it. And judging by the questions that we've had today, the amazing audience here, you guys are, are right into it. I have to say, right, and Arturo would back me up on this, you guys have far more interesting questions 
sorry, Sydney, you know, in the camera. Now, I'm looking at the camera here because this is recorded. Um, but Sydney hasn't had as much questions as, as this. I mean, we have to fly William up here from Melbourne all the way to Sydney to ask some really great questions and stuff. So, uh, well done. Give yourselves a pat on the back, guys. Congratulations. Like, no, seriously, this is a great event, better than we expected it to be. Um, can, I just, can I just say, if you guys are taking photos or anything like that, or regardless, just please connect with us on the Twitter, because like I said, I killed the website for 24 hours. Um, the website is defi.org.au. It's on the meetup, um, but feel free to stick around for drinks and stuff. Do you guys want to add anything to, to finish up for now, or are we going to release the hounds to the bar? Release? So. Sorry, I mean, oh, Pete. Pete. oh, Pete's got something new. Sorry. Uh, sorry, what was the... Oh, okay. Yeah, so we're launching a new product, which is all in stealth at the moment, so you can't tell anyone, all right? No one knows anything about it yet. No, no, but, no. so it's a carbon trading platform. I'm happy to talk about it. We're actually going to start publicly putting things out. So it is a, a carbon trading platform and carbon exchange, so it's more like Coinbase than it is like... Beta carbon. Climadow. Climad oh, yeah, no, we're not. No, Climadow. No, no Climadow. There is no Climadow. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's a new product. It's a second product. And happy to chat to anybody who's interested. But uh, yeah, we're still a few months away before we're going to launch. Thanks, everyone. You're awesome.